Mr Chair. Mr Chair, this is a, a troubling debate at many levels, clearly. What we're talking about here is the fundamental right of an accused to face their accuser. That is a right that has been enshrined for centuries, and now it appears for, on a matter of convenience, efficiency, cost-saving, that right has been placed under threat. It's concerning to see a trend emerging almost. A few, earlier in this session, we were debating the issue of pr uh, prisoners and victims' compensation. And within the context of that debate, I was proposing that there was an absolute responsibility on the state to protect the human rights of an inmate in prison. And that was challenged. There was question raised. Perhaps the, the human rights of an inmate actually could be diminished or compromised in some way that was still legitimate. The, the arguments about justice, about the rightness, about absolute rights or not have been engaged at quite an articulate level. I won't endeavour to, um, to respond to that or to, re to reiterate that. The Minister, when he spoke a little earlier, referred to clauses 6 and 7 as creating some very, a very high bar, some criteria that would assure that only in the most exceptional circumstances would, this, um, would the event occur, that a prisoner would not be there to face his accuser. I'd refer to clause 6 that talks about the prisoner being able to, oh, I'm sorry, the defendant being able to effectively participate in his or her defence. Effectively participate. I would suggest that it is almost an oxymoron to suggest that a person could effectively participate in a trial at the end of a camera on a screen. I've been very intrigued to sit here observing the Minister during the course of this debate and the extent to which non-verbal communication is such an important part of this, of this ongoing discussion. With all respect to the Minister, I hope you'll excuse me treating him as a, an item of observation. At the moment, he is smiling and nodding. At different times in the discussion, he has nodded quite thoughtfully, accepting points made. At other points, he has arched his eyebrows, very clearly and uh, signalling that something of interest, something surprising, has been said. At other points, he has shaken his head quite firmly, indicating he does not agree with a point being made. Those are visual clues that can inform a debate, enrich a debate, and give a person a genuine means of effectively participating in a debate. Remove those non-visual cues and clues, and a person is clearly at a major disadvantage in engaging in a discussion, in, a, in a, an event which could have very serious and long-term consequences on that person's well-being. I am not a lawyer. I have taught resource management law, have no familiarity with with criminal law. What I do have some experience with is video conferencing. In my previous incarnation as a sustainable business advisor, I used to advocate for video conferencing, particularly for large organisations who routinely sent their employees, be they lawyers, architects, consultants, around the country. It's a very effective means of communicating, even at a quite a high level, for quite serious and complex issues. One can achieve that by video conference. However, the, the underwriting um, requirement to that is that there must first be a relationship established. I deny anyone to have a meaningful, um, purposeful and satisfactory engagement by, by video conference with someone with whom they have not formed an initial relationship. That is a key underpinning to the effectiveness of video conferencing. And I would argue that simply to put a prisoner in front of a camera and to have a courtroom looking at a screen, there is no relationship established. The non-visual cues are the non-verbal cues, I'm sorry, are not, not available to that person. It is undoubtedly um, it's an absolute compromise, a, a denial of that notion of effective participation. There's a very easy remedy to this evening. Um, I could say in passing we would absolutely support um, David Parker's proposal to suspend this debate, to allow the moment to think, to breathe and to look for better options. What we do have on the table this evening is an SOP from my colleague, Mr um, Kennedy Graham, that states quite simply, um, so pr proposing in the new 9.1 to say AVL must not be used in any criminal substantive matter for the appearance of a defendant unless the defendant so elects. Put the, put the right back where it belongs to the defendant to choose. Mr. Mr. Chair. Mr. Uh, Chair. David Clendon. 
Mr Bridges made a point earlier that the, the right of appearance in a court could be taken away through misbehaviour. In fact, that right would not be taken away or denied through misbehaviour. That right would be surrendered. He quite clearly indicated, if I was to begin, I have a right as a Member of Parliament to stand and speak in this chamber. It's not an absolute right, but it's a very, very powerful right. If I was to stand here and hurl abuse at the chair, at a colleague, if I was to begin throwing glasses of water about, the right, and I don't propose to do that, I assure you, the right then would not be taken away from me to appear in this chamber. I would be surrendering that right through my mis misbehaviour, through my abuse of this place. Exactly the same situation as the, um, the, the few instances that Mr Bridges was able to muster. We have not yet heard a substantial reply to the challenge put by my colleague. Let us have a list of the criminal cases in this country in the last 50 years that were conducted without the defendant being present. <coughs> the question that has been posed, and I'll finish again by posing it, what is the need for haste? What is the need for urgency in this matter? The House is not under urgency. This is a relatively straightforward piece of legislation, or it could be. It has been around for a wee while. A few weeks would not make any significant difference to the outcome, whether the bill is passed in its present form in an amended form. We would most certainly support a motion to suspend, and on that point I thank you for your attention. Kia ora.